The teachers are taught, though, be sure to stress to the students that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class we should be teaching science. Things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, then how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all, we just think we're here. Okay, you can forget about those folks, right? We're here. So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, God created it, or the world just made itself like the humanists believe. It just is self-existing and not created. Well, if the world just made itself, how could this happen? Boy, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally one day he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many of you have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on the airplane years ago flying from Dallas to San Francisco, and I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks in Knoxville have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> so here I was on the airplane about that far away from this guy, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that, so I talk about it with him. And he said he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, oh, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you have never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang, but my Big Bang is a lot different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. And so the professor took off on one of those answers that looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, <clears throat> Mr. Hoven, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago. That's a long time. All the matter in the universe. That's a lot of stuff. All the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. Say what? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Wow. That's one crowded dot. And heavy, too. <laughs> hey, and it ain't the first time it happened, boys and girls. This textbook says, Someday, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then, another Big Bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. I said, Professor, uh, what happened to your dot? He said, well, Hovind, 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the solar system was drawn into this little bitty tiny dot, and it was spinning. It spun faster and faster, and all of a sudden, shh, boom, it exploded, big bang. And the pieces that flew off became galaxies and sun, moon, stars, and here we are, you know, people, nothing but stardust. I said, sir, can I ask you a couple of questions, please? He said, sure, what do you want to know? You know, we got a three-hour flight sitting that far away from each other on the airplane. And I said, well, sir, i got a question. Uh, you said 20 billion years ago all the dirt got together for the big squish and the big spin and the big bang. Where did all the dirt come from? You know, who made matter? He said, we don't know that for sure. I said, okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I have no idea. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a Big Bang and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically, I believe in the beginning God and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me my theory is religious and your theory is scientific. <laughs> no, 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 they're both religious. The news media tries to make it look like it is science versus religion. No, it's not. It's not science versus religion. This is two religions. Evolution and creation are both religious. You have to believe in one or the other. The difference is, the evolution religion is tax-supported. That's the difference. One of many differences. I said, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? Else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, sir, does Berkeley uh, have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to your puke. You've been on them before? 
He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you really ought to get one. You know, you could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on there and get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. I'll tell you later. We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go faster, faster. Can't you go any faster? You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase uh, 60 miles an hour. They enter phase three where they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, though. Keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, you should enter phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. Now, when this happens, you will notice a very interesting phenomena of physics. If the merry-go-round is going clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or a pole. That's because of a law in physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. See, if a spinning object breaks apart, the pieces that fly off are going to spin the same direction because the outside is moving faster than the inside. And we could talk all day about the conservation laws if you'd like, but the professor said, yes, I know about the conservation laws. I said, well, good, sir. Then let me ask you a question. If the universe began as a spinning dot, like you said, why do two planets spin backwards and probably three? He got real quiet, puzzled look on his face. I said, sir, why do eight out of 91 known moons spin backwards? Why do Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons going both directions at the same time? Huh. Why is the sun 98% hydrogen and helium, but the other planets are less than 1% hydrogen and helium? And why are these nine planets so different from each other? If it all came from a big bang, I mean, what's, why are they all so different? Very different compositions. And why do some whole galaxies spin backwards? CNN did an article, Goofy Galaxy Spins in Wrong Direction. I said, sir, why are these things going backwards? He said, I don't know. Why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. <laughs> I said, sir, it's real simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God did it that way on purpose just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. The Big Bang Theory is ludicrous for numerous reasons, okay? If the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed, but it's not. Serious, serious problems with the Big Bang Theory. Even Fred Hoyle said, I have little hesitation in saying the sickly pall hangs over the Big Bang Theory. Is the sun shrinking? The sun is obviously burning. You can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. So if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number, because as soon as I give a number and say X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Uh, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century, which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know. But the fact is, it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, these, for 100 years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about 5 feet an hour. Of course, now, the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter, so it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several d indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the Earth uh, 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation that the sun would have been touching the Earth. The fact is the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the not only the polar diameter, but the equatorial diameter. The sun has uh, north and south pole like the Earth does. 
both measurements are diminishing in the last 160 years. It's been observed the sun is shrinking. Now the sun oscillates, it swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, but the overall trend is quite obviously toward shrinking. The sun is burning. That creates a problem. If you go backwards in time, the sun would be bigger and more massive, which is going to upset the gravitational pull. So I don't think it's logical to say the Earth's been going around the sun for billions of years while the sun is constantly losing this mass and losing its gravitational pull. Here. The world's population was only about a quarter of a billion. It looks like the whole population growth curve started about 4,400 years ago. Hmm. Now, if you believe in evolution, you've got a problem. You think man's been here for 3 million years. In 3 million years, the population would have grown. Right now, there'd be about 150,000 people per square inch. That would be crowded. No, man's not been here for millions of years. 